this morning. I hope you're excited to be in the Lord's house this morning. Amen. Amen. Allow me to express my profound appreciation to your pastor, my friend, my brother, for the sacred trust. I say to him publicly, publicly what I've already said to him privately, that I do not take our time, my invitation for granted, but that the sacred trust you have been given to me this weekend, I count it a joy. Calvary, you need to know you have a gem of a pastor. His heart for the Lord and his love for people uh, is not paralleled to many, but I am grateful that um, God has uh, knitted our hearts together and has allowed me to stop by here on my way to heaven to share with you, God's people, what God has said to me. Uh, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there, so if you have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 has already been read in your hearing. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And while you're turning there, let me just voice a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that is ours to be gathered in this high holy place. May we not take our gathering for granted, but with attitudes of gratitude and hearts filled with praise. Father, may we worship you. For we declare that you and you alone are worthy of our praise and our adoration. Forgive us for the many ways that we have failed you. And we pray even now, God, that as we turn our attention toward your word, that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us, that you would convict us. But ultimately, God, our prayer is that you will change us, shape and conform us, that we might look more like Jesus. For it's in his name and for his glory we pray. And all the people of God said, Amen. 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 Mark chapter 2. I know that it's been read from one version, but since uh, I'm preaching from a different version, I'll read it from my version. But the similarities are, are there, and uh, I believe that God would speak to us. If you're comfortable, you can stand for the reading of God's word, but feel free to sit if you so desire. But I will read verses 1 through 12 of Mark chapter 2. Hear ye the word of the Lord. And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was so that when they broke through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sin but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned this way within themselves, he said to them, why do you question me? about these things in your heart. Which is easier to say? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. He says to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went to his house in the presence of them all. And so they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amen. That's the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Allow me to use as a thought and a title that will shape our exchange this morning, we got to get you to Jesus. 
Mark chapter 2 is a wonderful story of a young man who has an encounter with Jesus. And the only reason that he has this encounter with Jesus is because he has four committed friends who make up their mind that they needed to work together because we got to get you to Jesus. It's really a wonderful narrative and a wonderful story and a challenge to each and every one of us because like those four men, we must also have the dogged determination to by all means necessary make sure that we're spending our energies getting people to Jesus. Mark chapter 2 opens with Jesus making his way into Capernaum. Your Bible says that he enters Capernaum again. This is not the first time he had been in Capernaum. In fact, if you flip over to chapter 1, verse 21, he enters Capernaum, and while he's in Capernaum, he immediately goes into the synagogue. And your Bible says that there he's teaching, and he's astounding those who are hearing him because he speaks with one with great authority. And then he leaves the synagogue, or even after he is speaking in the synagogue, there is an individual in the synagogue who, according to scripture, is possessed with an unclean spirit, which says to me that everybody, that you can be in the synagogue and still be unclean. But the Bible says that when he encounters this man with an unclean spirit in the synagogue, Jesus rebukes the spirit in the man and the man and the spirit comes out of the man. What a great place to be delivered in the synagogue. to Simon Peter's house. And when he gets to Simon Peter's house, Simon Peter's mother-in-law seems to have a fever. And your Bible says that Jesus touches her body and lifts her up. And at the moment he touches her and lifts her up, the fever leaves her. Jesus does great work in Capernaum. And so much so, his name, his fame, and his his statue is growing throughout Capernaum that people started bringing the sick and the afflicted. Many people were bringing the diseased and those who had issues to Jesus, and Jesus healed them. And now Jesus makes his way to Capernaum again in in Mark chapter 2. But when he gets to Mark chapter 2, The Bible says he's in this place and there is a rumor going around Capernaum that Jesus is in the house. Don't miss that. Because that is the rumor that's going on in Capernaum, the house is full. The house is full because there's a rumor going around the town that Jesus is in the house. The reason that's significant is because we better make sure that with all the rumors that are going on around this town, you better make sure, Calvary, that it is rumored that Jesus is in this house. There's a whole lot of rumors going around, but you better make sure that whatever, is, whatever else is being rumored in this community, you want above all else that it is rumor, it is evident that Jesus is in this house. So there's a rumor going around Harlingen, I'm sorry, around Capernaum, that Jesus is in the house. And because that is the rumor that was going around out there, it was full in here. See, the reason many of us are looking at me strange because we're not able to correlate the the connection between the rumor that was going on out there and the condition that was going on in here. The reason that the house was full was because there was a rumor out there that Jesus was in the house. Many of us are wondering how in the world are we going to get more people in here and I stopped by here on my way to heaven to say to us that if we want more people from out there in here then those people out there need to believe that Jesus is in this house. Jesus is in the house. 
Jesus has never had a problem drawing a crowd. Whenever you read scripture, whenever you see that Jesus was in the vicinity, great crowds, multitudes strong toward Jesus, because Jesus has never, ever had a problem drawing a crowd. And if we want to start reaching more people, and I hope we do, if we want to start seeing more people come to faith in Jesus Christ, and I hope we do, we better make sure that the rumors that are going around this town is that Jesus is in this house. But the Bible says Jesus is in the house, the multitude, I mean, the, the house is filled so much so that there's no longer room in the house. And Jesus preached the word to them. Now that's significant because it's not only that Jesus was preaching, but it was what Jesus was preaching that makes all the difference in the world. There are a whole lot of people running around calling themselves preaching, but they ain't preaching the word. They're preaching self-help. They're preaching politics. They're preaching uh, um, prosperity and all this other stuff, nationalism and denominationalism. Listen, my friends, Jesus gives us the model that what Jesus was preaching to the place, to the house full of people is Jesus was preaching the word. And we've got to get back to the place where men are standing flat-footed in the pulpit, opening God's word, reading God's word, proclaiming God's word, explaining God's word, declaring, thus saith the word of the Lord. Telling, we, telling you, if, we, we're, if we're going to begin to see the transformation in our society, if we're going to begin to see the transformation in our communities, if we're going to begin to see the transformation in our nation, we've got to get back to preaching the word of God. Even when it hurts. Even when it convicts us, even when it's uncomfortable, we've got to stand open God's word and declare what the word of God says. Jesus is preaching the word. I spend a whole lot of time in a whole lot of churches and I listen to a whole lot of sermons. And unfortunately, I'm not always walking away saying they preach the word. They said some words but they didn't preach the word. And we now have a society, we live in a, in a society where the popular churches and many of the popular uh, preachers on television, they're doing a whole lot of talking and they're saying some stuff, but they're not proclaiming the word. And they're leading people astray because they are giving uh, they are taking the text and many times they are twisting the text and taking the text out of context and people are gravitating and hanging on to their messages without realizing that their messages are untruthful because even when the word is being preached, the word has to be preached to people who recognize that it is the word which means the people have to recognize the word, which means the people must know the word, which means that the people must get in the word for themselves and not just take the preacher's word for it. We've got to get back to being a word central people. Ultimately, I'm going to walk through the text. So Jesus is in the house. There's a rumor going around the city that Jesus is here. And because that is the rumor that's going around in the city, people from the city came to where Jesus was. And there are a whole lot of us in here wanting Jesus to fill this house, right? We're wanting the days when the pews are packed we're wanting the doors to be filled. Aren't, uh, isn't that what we really want? Let me say to you, Jesus will never, ever fill this house until he first fills this house. 
And there are a whole lot of us hoping that Jesus will fill this house without totally allowing him to fill this house. But if Jesus will fill this house, it will be evident, and then ultimately Jesus will fill this house. So let me just ask a question. Has Jesus filled this house for you? Has Jesus taken residence in your heart? Are you allowing, allowing Jesus to fill you daily with his spirit? Because Jesus will never fill this house until he first fills this house. There's a rumor that Jesus is in the house. And because that's the rumor, the house was full. And Jesus stands and he proclaims to the masses the word of God. But my friends, we must be burdened by those who need Jesus. Now, the Bible says, can I just be myself? The Bible says that the house is full. For many of us, if our houses were full, we would be content that our houses were full. But Jesus says, or the story helps us to understand that even though the house is full, there were four men who were not content that the house was full. They recognized they had a burden for somebody who wasn't there who needed to be there. Many of us celebrate those who are here without having a burden for those who aren't here. But I love the narrative of the story because these four men were burdened and they were not content that the house was filled. They were not satisfied with all that had come. They recognized one who needed to be here who wasn't there. And because they were burdened, they were willing to be inconvenienced and uncomfortable to go where he was in order to get him to where Jesus is. My friends, we must be burdened for lost people. We must be burdened for people who do not know Jesus. We must be burdened for people who need to hear the gospel. These men were not content until their friend got to Jesus. I ask a lot of questions, so let me just ask you another question. Who are you burdened for? Who do you know who needs to know Jesus? These men were burdened. We must be burdened. There are 19 plus million people in the state of Texas who do not know Jesus. And unfortunately, far too many of us are satisfied with the status quo. But we must be burdened for lost people. Jesus came for lost people. Jesus died for lost people. I was, we were, you were the reason he came. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And I just don't know why we're not excited to be saved and then be committed to helping join God in what God is doing in the lives of others. We must be burdened. So these four men were not content that the house was full. But they recognized that somebody needed Jesus. So the story says that these four men had one friend. And these four men were determined to get their friend to Jesus. So these four men had to work in partnership because each man perhaps carried a corner of the bed or the the cot or the, the, the mat that the man was lying on and they recognized that if we will work together, 
then maybe we can get our friend to Jesus. If we work in partnership, if we're not concerned with who gets the credit, if we're not concerned with who gets the pat on the back or the acknowledgement, if each one of us would take, take responsibility for our assignment and do what we need to do and work together, then we might get this man to Jesus. That's a lesson that many of us good Baptists need to learn. That if we would learn how to work together, if we're not concerned with who gets the credit or whose name is listed in the bulletin or who gets the recognition, if we're not concerned with who gets the pats on the back, then we can begin to see people to Jesus. Think about it. With all of these churches in Harlingen, all of these people who are saying they love Jesus, all of these people singing all of these songs, and all of these men standing and proclaiming God's word, why does it seem like there's more lost people than there are people in church on Sunday? We're not in competition with each other. It's amazing how we think we're in competition with the church down the street or around the corner. There are enough lost people to go around. And if we want them, we've got to go and reach them. These men understood that if we want our friend to come to Jesus, we've got to go where he is, and we've got to make sure to do whatever it takes to get him to Jesus. My fourth little point that as I'm walking through this text, we must be willing to overcome obstacles and opposition in order to get people to Jesus. We must, you and I, must be willing to overcome obstacles and opposition to get people to Jesus. So here's the story. These four men carry their corner, get their man to the house, get their friend to the house where Jesus was. There's only a problem. The Bible says they can't get in. The church is filled. The temple is filled. There's no room for them. They can't get in the front door. They can't get in the side door. They can't get in the back door. There's no room for them. But these men are committed. They are determined. They do not accept um, the obstacles that have been presented to them. So they Think outside the box. And listen, my friends, if we're going to reach people who are far from God, we've got to be willing to think outside the box. We've got to be willing to do things that we've never done before in order to see people come to faith in Christ. We've got to be willing to overcome obstacles. We've got to remove our traditions. We've got to get out of the box that we put, it, put God in if we're going to reach people for Jesus. Sometimes it means change the music. Sometimes it means changing the, the order of service. Sometimes it means changing some things, tweaking some things, adjusting some things so that we might get people to Jesus. The question is, do we want people to come to Jesus? Now, many of us say we do. We're just not willing to give up anything in order to get it. We're not willing to change. Listen, I'll say this once and I may say it again. If you always do what you always did, then you always get what you always got. And there are a whole lot of us who keep doing the same old thing over and over and over and over again, and we keep getting the same old results. Well, if it ain't working, you've got to be willing to change something. People ask me all the time, why are our churches plateaued and declining? Why are there so much empty spaces in our churches? And I say to them, because sometimes churches are not willing to change with the, com with the culture and the community. Now, there are some things that we do not change. We do not change. We hold fast to the doctrine of the gospel. We believe in the inerrancy of God's word. But some of the stuff that it's tied us is not biblical and we ought to be willing to change it. 
Listen, I'm preaching a whole lot better than y'all are responding. And I know a message like this makes us uncomfortable because we get so tied up in our tradition and we keep doing what we've always done, wondering why it's no longer working or whether it ever really worked. But we keep on doing it, wondering why people aren't coming. I like the determination of these four men because these four men said, listen, we're willing to do what." Ever it takes to get this man to Jesus. So they try to get in the front door, but the church is filled and they can't get in. So somebody has a creative idea. Hey, let's do something that's never been done before. Let's climb up on the roof and let's tear a roof in another man's house. Now, I don't recommend you do that in 2023. And let's tear the roof and let's let him down right at the feet of Jesus because if we let him down at the feet of Jesus, just maybe Jesus might minister to you. So these four men, these nameless four men who were determined and dedicated and committed to getting their friend to Jesus, tears the roof off of this house and starts lowering the man at the foot of Jesus. So you've got to see the picture. Jesus is in the house. He's preaching the word. All of a sudden, perhaps straw and wood starts falling and Jesus looks up and all of a sudden he sees a man being lowered down and he shifts his attention from the crowd and looks at the one that's being lowered from the ceiling. Then he looks at the four who are determined and committed to lower their friend at the foot of Jesus. And your Bible says that after Jesus turns his attention from the crowd to the one, shifts his attention to the four, says to the four, because of your faith, son, your sins are forgiven you. And it's all because these four men were determined to get their friend to Jesus. But the story doesn't end there. Because your Bible says that Jesus looks at their faith and because of their faith, he speaks life and healing into the one. We don't know whether or not the paralytic had any faith at all. He may not have had faith in Jesus, but he did have faith in his friend. I'm saying something and y'all are missing it. Because sometimes long before people will ever trust Jesus, they will trust their friends. And he, this man, had enough faith in his friends. See, I don't have many friends who would carry me on the top of a roof and lower me down at the feet of Jesus. That's a special kind of friend. So since I like to ask questions, let me just ask you another question. Are you that kind of friend? A friend that will do whatever it takes to get your friends, your family members, your loved ones to Jesus. So the Bible says, sees their faith, speaks to the one, and says, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven you. The Bible says that there are some scribes there, there are some religious leaders in the house. But they're not there for the right reason. They're there questioning, they're watching, and they're looking and see what Jesus does, and they begin to question in their hearts. 
Because the Bible says these men are reasoning within themselves. How dare this man create blasphemies? Doesn't he know that only God can forgive sin? And because our God, Jesus Christ, is omniscient, he knows all things. He knows their thoughts. Be careful, my friends. God knows your thoughts. Some of you are sitting in this place and you have some unrighteous thoughts. Be careful. He knows your thoughts. Jesus, because he knows their thoughts, turns his attention. So here's the shifting He turns his attention from the crowd, looks at the one, shifts his attention to the four, speaks to the one and says to him, your sins are forgiven you. Then he shifts his attention to the scribes and says, why are you questioning these things in your heart? Is it easier for me to say to this man, rise, take up your bed and walk? Or to say to him, your sins are forgiven you, but so that you might know that I am the son of God and I have all authority. He shifts his attention from the scribes back to the one and he says to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. He's already spoken to this man. He's already addressed his spiritual need and now he's addressing his physical need. Because remember, Jesus initially says to him, son, your sins are forgiven you. He addresses his spiritual need because, listen, my friends, we must recognize that what people need is people need Jesus. We must address their physical needs, but ultimately their greatest need is they need Jesus. So even while we're trying to meet their physical needs, we must make sure that the physical needs are a bridge to sharing their spiritual needs. And that is that they need Jesus. So Jesus has already addressed his spiritual needs, and now Jesus addresses his physical needs, says to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he does that in the presence of the multitude. Because everyone in the house was not in the house for the same reason. But I've got to hurry up and get out of your way. It's really a wonderful story. Because something happens, because when this man heard the command of Jesus to rise, take up his bed and walk, your Bible says he gets up, picks up his bed, and he walks out in the presence of them all. I'm not making it up, that's what happened. But something happens in the house because of what happened to him. Because your Bible says when the multitude saw what God did in him, it stirred up something in them. You don't believe me. Look at the text. Look at the text. Immediately, 12th verse, immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they all were amazed, and they all glorified God. So now you have a house full of people who are amazed and glorifying God because they saw what God did in the life of this man. If you want God to start stirring up stuff in here, you start working in the lives of people out there. And when you start seeing what God does in the lives of people out there, then it ought to stir up something in here. We've been talking about revival. We've been praying for revival. Everybody's saying what the world needs is revival. Well, listen, if we're really really going to really appreciate revival, then we... We've got to begin to be involved in what God is doing in the lives of others. Yes, we want God to revive us, but if you really want God to revive you, you start doing work in the lives of people out there. So the house was filled when Jesus was there. But now it's a house full of people who are glorifying God. You see the shift? It's not good enough just to have a house full of people. 
You want a house full of people who are glorifying God. And if you want to be a house full of people who are glorifying God, then you start watching God do work in the lives of people who are far from him. Ultimately, here's the essence of my little message. We've got to get people to Jesus. We must be willing to overcome obstacles in opposition, to do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. Because if we go to heaven and they go to hell, Calvary, we have failed. If we go to heaven and they go to hell, we have failed in our assignment. we must be willing to change some things. Now, there are some things we don't change. But there are some things that ought to be fluid. And if they work, we keep doing them. And if they don't work, we have to be willing to tweak them. But sometimes we're not willing, we're not able to reach people because we get boxed into our traditions and we want to do what we've always done. And for many of our Southern Baptist churches, if we ever get back to 1972, we're ready. But we're not going back to 1972. And so you can't do what you did in 1972 trying to reach people in 2024. The message never changes, but the methods change. Because if you always do what you always did, then you always get what you always got. Two questions and then I'm on my way to my seat. Who do you know who needs to know Jesus? It might be a family member. It might be a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister, a mother or a father, a niece, a nephew, a grandchild. Who do you know who needs Jesus? It might be a coworker or a classmate, a neighbor or a friend. Who do you know? Then my second question is, what are you willing to do in order to get them to Jesus? Who do you know and what are you willing to do? And sometimes the first step to getting people to Jesus is you've got to be willing to pray for them. Because I'm convinced that long before you talk to people about God, you ought to talk to God about those people. And so in just a second, as the ministry team is now into place, pastor will assume the role We want to open up the altar and maybe the first step before you ever talk to that family member about Jesus is we need to intercede for them. And so the altar is available. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to do business with God at the the altar. We invite you to come. Maybe you're here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We'd love to help you make the most important decision of your life. And that is to place all of your faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ. Pastor will come and he will help you to make that decision. The altar is available. If you need to make a decision, maybe you're looking for a church home and you've been visiting a while, but God is saying to you, this is the day for you to say yes. The word of God always demands a response. How will you respond to the word of the Lord? Amen. Thank you, Richard. And we do appreciate God's servant. Now let's appreciate the Jesus that he talked about. And let's stand and sing. And as God's Spirit has touched your heart, 
and press the appeal that Richard gave to you to pray, to give your life to Jesus, to become a member of this church and follow the Lord Jesus with us and be that body that goes out there because Jesus is in here. You step out and you come. While we sing, we'll wait. You come. Come now.